inflation continues to skyrocket. The latest report released this morning shows consumer prices in June increased by 9.1% over last year. That is a new 40-year high. Well, from housing to utilities to food and gas, 41% of Americans need a side job just to meet their monthly expenses. And more than one-third of Americans are working extra hours to offset soaring prices. Charlene Aaron has more. Before prices at the pump and supermarket started taking off, economists noticed a growing number of Americans putting money toward credit card debt or building their savings. Now, according to a new survey by Bankrate, 41 percent of Americans need a side income just to help pay for monthly expenses from housing to utilities to food. When prices started going up and inflation started happening, I really had to take a step back and I realized I actually wasn't going to be able to finish the semester out. Halfway through her senior year, 23-year-old Shayna Bourne felt the need to drop out of college due to her tight budget. After becoming a full-time nanny, Shayna soon realized she would need more to make ends meet. That forced her to turn a hobby into a second job. I had a camera. It was kind of just a hobby, and I would, you know, go out with friends and shoot or if I went on vacation. But I realized that that was a skill set that I did have and equipment I had, and so the Lord's blessed me with great clients, and I've been able to utilize that as a source of the second income. As the cost of living continued to go up, Shayna then picked up a third job. The extra money is going towards my immediate bills. I've gone through my finances over and over and over, and it's like there's just a little extra needed in each place, whether it's gas or groceries even. Rent has actually taken an uptick in the last few months. Shayna is not alone. Inflation is driving more than a third of Americans to increase working hours due to rising prices. Your Bank rates Ted Rossman day says day that any additional income is often going toward putting food on the table or paying rent. Fewer people are using this money for discretionary expenses. Fewer people are boosting their savings. Not that many people are paying down debt. It's primarily a day-to-day -day expenses kind of story. Shana says that describes many she knows. I think everyone's kind of struggling right now. I think everyone's looking for ways to make ends meet. It would be a stretch for me to try to think of a friend or family member who's not trying to get additional income. Rossman says that underscores the financial burden many are carrying. It's just too bad because I would hope that if you're doing that, you're getting ahead. You know, maybe the prize at the end of the rainbow is a vacation or that you're going to knock out your credit card debt or that you're going to boost your retirement fund. It's tough when you're doing this extra stuff just to kind of stay on that treadmill. Meanwhile, Shana tries to keep her college degree hope alive as she continues to do what she can now just to stay afloat. I'm trying to build that income for whatever is to come, um, but I'm not sure how long I'll be doing this. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, inflation is such a trap and it just eats away at everything. It eats away at your ability to save. It eats away at your ability to stay out of credit card debt. Uh, it's an incredible tax, and it hits the lower income more than anyone. Uh, if everyone is feeling the pinch right now, those who are uh, at uh, minimum wage or just above are really feeling it. And I hope the administration pays attention. Last year, there were plenty of warnings, and they dismissed all the warnings. Well, the warnings are now here. They're, they're being fulfilled, and it doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. I hope they can take some strong steps to stop this. In other news, President Biden is in Israel today, beginning his first presidential visit to the Middle East. Efron Graham has more on that story from our CBN newsroom. Efron. Gordon, the president's four-day trip begins with several days in Israel, where he'll meet with government leaders as well as the Palestinians. President Biden arrived at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. Today's events, including a meeting with Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz for a briefing on the country's Iron, Iron Dome missile defense system. We have a full agenda over the next two days because the relationship between Israel and the United States covers every issue that matters to our mutual futures. We're united in our shared values and our shared vision. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell will bring us the highlights of the president's trip all this week on the 700 Club. As always, viewers can go to CBNNews.com for the very latest. 
In Washington, Congress is trying to tackle the rising tide of violence in a new world order post Roe versus Wade. Witnesses on both sides of the abortion debate testified on Capitol Hill Tuesday, telling Senate lawmakers about what they've witnessed in the days since the Supreme Court's decision. CBN's Abigail Robertson reports. The one thing both sides seem to agree on during the hearing is that the violence we've seen across the country since the leak of the Supreme Court's decision needs to stop. The violence has been overwhelming that we have sustained. In recent weeks, pro-abortion rights groups have firebombed and vandalized crisis pregnancy centers around the country that offer free health care for pregnant women and support mothers and babies. We have been forced to expend valuable resources, resources for women of up to $150,000 just to protect ourselves. Abortion activists argued they've been targeted by protesters too, who blockade access to their clinics. I absolutely condemn violence against everyone, including abortion providers. <laughs> and claimed overturning Roe will lead to an increase in America's maternal mortality rate. People will suffer unnecessary harm as doctors wait for permission from hospital lawyers. Pro-life witnesses claimed patients given the abortion pill are not prepared for what comes next. At one point, she said she looked down and what they told her was a clump of cells was a fully formed baby laying on the floor. This is not health care. In a heated exchange, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic. Republican Senator Josh Hawley questioned a Berkeley professor's use of the term people with a capacity for pregnancy in place of women. I'm is denying that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking Are you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think women can <laughs> so get pregnant. So you are denying that trans people exist? Abortion proponents testified that not only do they want abortion access codified into law, but they also want Congress to do away with the Hyde Amendment, which prevents taxpayer dollars from funding abortion. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. A new survey shows few Americans believe the Bible is the literal word of God. According to a recent Gallup poll, 20% of U.S. adults believe the Bible is the actual word of God. That's down from 24% five years ago. 49% of adults believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Those numbers are a bit better among professing Christians. 25% said they believe the Bible is literally true, while 58% say it is the inspired word of God. Professor Tom Meyer is known as the Bible memory man because he's memorized at least 20 books of the Bible. Tom is also dedicated to teaching Christians how to hide the word in their heart because he's convinced it is the key to a transformed life. CBN's Billy Hallowell shares his powerful perspective. Tom Meyer is a professor at Shasta Bible College in Redding, California. He's personally memorized 20 books of the Bible. Now he's on a mission to inspire others to do the same. Why is it important in your view to memorize scripture? Number one, it puts the mind of God within reach. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, Billy, you have like instant access to the mind of the living God. But you might say, I have it on my phone. I know that's good. <laughs> that's great, but it's different. It is different. You know it is because you don't have your phone with you 24 seven and all these kind of things. But to be able to instantly think upon the mind of the living God, that's great. Meyer believes this level of scripture knowledge can change the way we think about the world around us. Skylar Rowan, one of his past students, agrees. When I have that time to recite and just the, the way it changes how you think, because now it's like, okay, now I'm, I'm making a much more dedicated, concerted effort to spending my thoughts and my words on scripture. There's times like when I've wanted to react a certain way, but because I was reciting something from Philippians talking about humility, it's like, oh, it, it comes to my mind. And then I, I, you know, at that point, I make the choice of whether or not to, to submit myself to scripture to, you know, to sin and go my own way. Meyer says having scripture on our hearts rather than on a shelf or on our phones can also help us to better love and comfort others. If you get tongue tied with someone and you don't know what to say and they're hurt and you want to share the right thing, it's like apples of gold and pictures of silver, Billy, right? It's the most precious, beautiful thing that you can say to someone comes from the word of God. What would be your advice for a first step for somebody who wants to embark on this journey, but they're not sure how to do it? 
Number one, pray. <laughs> pray that God would help you. Number two, pick something small with light at the end of the tunnel, like Titus or Jonah or something. If you did just one verse a week from those, you could have the whole book memorized in a, in a year, just one verse a week, and figure out what works best for you, either reading it aloud or hearing it or writing it like I do, or a combination thereof. So figure out what technique works for you and just do it, and you'll see the benefits that come from it. In addition to teaching college students, Meyer also volunteers at the Creation Museum in Petersburg, Kentucky, where he helps others learn to commit scriptures to memory and get closer to God. I'm Billy Hollowell for CBN News. Effort. I'm inspired. Gordon? We should all be inspired by that and how it literally changes your thought process. The more you meditate on scripture, the more you commit scripture to memory it will change your thinking. And that is one of the keys. When you start having your mind become closer to the mind of Christ, what did Jesus do to resist the devil? He quoted scripture to him. He quoted from the book, book of Deuteronomy. In the first century, the Pharisees would memorize the first five books. They would memorize the Torah and be able to recite it from memory in order to keep it and to keep it in their daily lives, to live their life according to the Word of God. We can do that today. All it takes is say, well, can I memorize a verse a day? And can I keep some verses in memory? Can I look at Psalms? Can I memorize Psalm 23? And in moments of crisis say, the Lord is my shepherd. Can I have these things ready in my recall so I can stand in the day of trial. Ashley? Well, 20 books of the Bible is a lot. Do you foresee yourself memorizing 20 I books of the Bible? I do not. You know, <laughs> at, at, at my age, uh, it, you know, just trying to remember all my nieces and nephews is a problem. So you know, well, trying even, to do 20 books would be hard. Yeah. But I, I admire people that do. I yes, do absolutely. try to commit scripture to memory. Yes. Uh, so it's right there and, and I can, uh, you know, access it. It does change mm -hmm. your thinking. It really does. It really does. But even at my age, 20 books of the Bible is a lot. But kudos to that man. <laughs> All right, guys, well, be sure to tune in to the 700 Club next Wednesday, July 20th. Pat Robertson will be back in our studio along with Wendy Griffith. Pat will be answering your voicemail questions live on air. So to leave a question for Pat, make sure you guys call the number on your screen right now. It's 1-800-677-7884. The phone lines will be open today only between now and 5 p.m. Eastern time. So once again, make sure you call Call the number on your screen, 1-800-677-7884. And be sure to watch the 700 Club next Wednesday, July 20th, to hear Pat answer your voicemail questions. Democrats are facing huge challenges in the 2024 elections. One of them is Latino voters, a growing demographic, and they're moving to the right. CBN's Matt Galka reports from Nevada, where the battle is on to secure these crucial votes. Are Latino voters shying away from Democrats? The demographic has been highly sought after and will continue to be by both parties as we head into November. And the work is already being done on the ground here in Nevada. Do you think I could leave this at your door? I work with Mictoro, Nevada. Door after door in the sizzling heat of the Las Vegas summer. You guys gonna vote early this year or in election day? Election, election, day. election day. Mauricio Garcia knocks on doors for Make the Road Nevada, attempting to persuade prospective voters. Pues, uh, llega, ya... The conversations vary from immigration to inflation to health care. And our Una del Movimiento cards, right? Civic Engagement Director Jessica Padron is well aware of the inroads made by the GOP and worries about an exodus of Latino voters to the right. She's concerned Democrats may have taken this key voting block for granted and need to wake up. I, I do feel that while some of the policies uh, may not be very popular from the Republican Party, they are investing way more and doing outreach offices in these communities. They're doing events in these communities. 
the Democratic playbook has not changed. <laughs> They're still doing the same, what I call mariachi politics, which is a taco truck, some mariachis in the same little couple corners. And that doesn't reach when you have, you know, for example, a Nicaraguan community, Cuban community, other groups. I think it's really important that we engage all these voters and not just say, well, they're automatically going to vote Republican or they're automatically going to vote Democrat. It's about who talks to you, who makes you feel good, who educates you and who's there for you not just during the election period, but after. Nevada could become ground zero, where the true impact of a movement is revealed, possibly signaling which party will go on to control Congress after the midterm elections. In 2020, Latinos made up more than 400,000 eligible voters in the Silver State, a number that's projected to make up about one out of five votes cast here. Both parties would like the numbers on their side. Political insider and Nevada Independent Editor Elizabeth Thompson says it would be unwise for Democrats to focus on a singular issue like immigration, with issues like inflation and rising costs squeezing all Nevada voters. Um, but the numbers don't lie. Um, one of the reasons that Donald Trump won in Nevada last time around was because he got a larger share of the Hispanic and Latino vote than most people expected him to. I think that was a little bit of a wake-up call um, for the Democrats. And the trends are hard to ignore. Joe Biden lost ground with Hispanic voters in 2020, while Donald Trump made 10-point gains nationwide. Republicans are trying to keep that momentum going in 2022. <laughs> the Libre Initiative is focusing its ground game on the economy. Libre's Eddie Diaz says anxiety over the cost of living can be tied directly to the party that's in power now. Talking about how this year we're going to pay over $5,000 more in taxes, we're going to pay like $1,200 more just in gas, uh, or close to $500 more in groceries, and, and, and they're taking notice of that. And they know who's in power, which administration has control currently, and they're getting turned off. Democrats took another hit in June when Texas Republican Myra Flores won a special election in a heavily Latino House district that had traditionally voted blue. We cannot accept the increase of gas, of food, of medication. We cannot accept that. Flores is getting national attention now, and Pastor Samuel Rodriguez believes her win is just the beginning. Florida, Texas, Nevada, even California, we saw the flipping of certain districts, very strong progressive districts, flipping red, not even going purple going from hard blue to red. And there was one common denominator. These districts were primarily over 60% Hispanic populated. Rodriguez is an influential voice as leader of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, which represents more than 40,000 churches nationwide. While he welcomes this trend and believes it's rooted in faith values, he says it's premature to anoint the GOP as the party of Latinos. As more and more whites shift towards the left, more and more Latinos are shifting towards the right. So be careful in wanting to deport the future of the conservative movement. So, I, you know, that sort of language, tone, rhetoric, um, it, it's important that for Republicans to be cognizant and aware of that. Back on the ground in Nevada, Marco Hernandez considers himself part of the shift. A candidate for one of the seats on the Clark County Commission, he ran as a Democrat last election cycle and came up just short. He switched to an independent since then. I'm actually um, one of them. Um, I went from being a Democrat to a nonpartisan for the same reason that everybody feels like, you know, um, both party lines are blaming each other for work that needs to be done and nobody wants to do anything about it. So people are fed up and um, they want to see change. They don't want to see the same, the same old politics. Now, one of the reasons that both parties are so focused on the demographic, the Latino population has quintupled in the country in the past 50 years. Nevada could be an indication of where at least some of those voters are going. In Las Vegas, Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, there's obviously political change in America today, but listen to that comment. Uh, I think both parties need to wake up and listen to that. What people are asking for is not partisanship, how far to the right can we go or how far to the left can we go? They're looking for a government that can actually govern and can actually get things done. Most Americans just throw up their hands in the current situation that you can't get anything done and you can't move anything forward. And in that environment, it looks like partisanship is winning. One of the prime drivers here is as the Democrat Party becomes more and more progressive, 
and they start targeting uh, moderate Democrats in primaries and, and intentionally trying to take them out. Well, the Latinos know what it means to live in a socialist country. Cubans know that. Venezuelans know that. They don't want any part of that. So that's why you're seeing the shift to the Republican Party. It's because the Democrats are becoming more socialist. So they don't want that. They know exactly what's going to happen to a country that embraces socialism. And they say, that's why we left. And that's why we came to America. So th that's the short-term thing. The long-term thing? When you look at the face of Christianity in America by 2050, that face is going to be Hispanic. And the reason is the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, the, the WASP community, is leaving the faith. And who's coming in to replace it? Well, it's Hispanic families. Well, during the height of the pandemic, millions of Americans started logging on to TikTok, including myself. Many of them used it to record short videos of themselves, like trying out the latest viral dance craze. But Christina wanted to use the platforms for something else. She wanted to encourage others with a much needed message of hope. Social media influencer and author Christina Baker became TikTok famous by posting one minute videos of her praying and encouraging viewers. Wait, let me pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, we lift you up today, and I thank you that every person will be utterly convinced of your greatness, of your holiness, and of your goodness in their life. In her book, Hope in 60 Seconds, Christina shares her journey from drug addiction and homelessness to complete restoration in Christ. All right, well, joining us now is Christina Baker. Christina, welcome to the 700 Club. It's so good to have you with us this morning. It's great to be here this morning, Ashley. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right. Well, we got to talk about your TikTok page. You are at 1 million followers. What prompted you to even start your TikTok page? And why do you think it just became so popular? Well, you know, I was never a social media person prior to this, Ashley. Actually, I had a dream two years ago the Lord gave me and basically in the dream, I just kind of saw the darkness over social media and felt like I need to just hop on and give people the hope that was given to me in some of the darkest moments of my life. And so I just literally in the middle of the night after Good Friday in 2020, I sat in a corner in my bedroom, opened my phone and just prayed a scripture out of Joshua 1 and 9. And then the next morning, my husband and I were just pretty shocked because the video had gone viral. I believe that right now what's happening and something you know shifted so big globally in 2020, as we all know, but people, what we saw initially was that people just were grasping for hope. Yeah. And so whether you find it in you know money or you know people are looking for it in different places, but I knew in my heart, you know, it was a time for us to offer the hope that is only found in Jesus. Amen. Amen to that. Well, you haven't always been a Christian. What caused you to turn from drugs at uh, such a young age? Tell us your, your come to Jesus moment. Yeah, well, there were, there were many different moments as, you know, so many of us have leading up to, I, my dad was an atheist. I followed in his footsteps went, you know, him and I were living homeless in a tent on the beach when I was 15 years old, went from house to house, um, ended up strung out on drugs for many years. Get it? I ended up getting arrested. And when I got out of jail, I was out on bail and I went back to my job and a man came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder and said that he had a word from the Lord for me. Wow. And as an atheist, I was like a word from the Lord. You know, <laughs> I, I just, this is my last resort. And walked into a prayer meeting he invited me to, and um, everybody began laying hands on me, and it was a wrap after that. It was, I was introduced to the Lord that day. That is amazing. But even before that, there was a moment in the back of a cop car, and you prayed to the Lord. What was that prayer, and what was that conversation like with the Lord? Yeah, I believe the Lord was waiting for that moment all of my life, because I believe that was my first prayer. I mean, I, I've you know, I'm handcuffed in the back of the cop car. And I just looked up and was like, you know, if you're real, why are you doing this to me? Wow. And that opened up a conversation that would have no end. And um, I believe that 
that moment for me was the moment where everything changed. I had no idea that, you know, within the next couple of weeks, I would be, you know, fully surrendering my life to the Lord Jesus after sticking my fist up at him most of my life. Wow, wow. Well, Christina, tell us about the the relationship that you had with your son's father. Uh, in your book, you talk about how you gave birth to your son at a young age and you had come to Jesus. And then you had a conversation with this with this person. Tell us about that conversation and then what shortly happened to him after that conversation. Yeah, well, he called me on July 15th um, of 2010 and I, I didn't initially take the phone call, but I, you know, I, the very next day he called me back and, you know, he tried to talk to me like, you know, we were when, when I was back living in the world and things quickly shifted. I heard the Lord say in my heart, tell him to stop what is, what he's doing. And so I said, Hey, I feel like I have a word from the Lord for you. And, um, you, whatever it is that you're doing, you need to, you need to stop. And he starts weeping on the other end of the line and recommits his life to the Lord after I shared my testimony of meeting Jesus. Wow. And about a week later, he calls me back. We prayed together on the phone. He said, this is, I've never felt this close to God in my entire life. And uh, we, you know, get off the phone. Okay, bye, bye, bye. We forgave each other. It was just, it was a powerful moment of reconciliation. And I, I just thought, okay, this is, you know, this is a moment where we're gonna, you know, begin to work things out. Um, and a day and a half later, uh, he hits the only tree in sight, dies instantly at 10:58 at night near Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge lesson in my life, Ashley. In that, you know, we life is but a vapor, and we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't even know what the next hour holds. And but it was at that very last moment of his life that the Lord opened up a door of opportunity for him to give his life to the Lord. Yeah. And I know that uh, when we get to heaven, he's going to be on the other side. I know that a thousand percent yeah. and because of God's grace, because in the final moments of our life, God steps in and gives us that grace. It's like the thief next to Jesus on the cross. Yeah, and what you did in that moment, I believe is such a reflection of what you're doing for so many people, even now on TikTok. You're leading people into prayer and you're leading them into knowing Jesus. But in your book, you describe three miracles that happened in your life. What are those three miracles? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, there are so many, but let me yeah. let me tell you about the, the when I had brain surgery um, when I was 24 years old and my dad, as I shared with you, he was an atheist. And when I'm going up into the operating room to have brain surgery, he lets my husband and I know that, uh, that he had committed his life to the Lord the night before. And he just said this, he was all by himself in his, in his apartment. He said, God, if, if you're real, if you just get my daughter through this, I will serve you. So he gives his life to the Lord that day. Um, and so right before I'm going into brain surgery, I get to have this news that my dad has given his life to Jesus. And 10 days after the surgery, my mom, who was uh, also not a believer, uh, she gave her life to the Lord as well, uh -huh. just watching me go through that brain surgery. Um, and so, and also, you know, the miracle of going through the brain surgery and the Lord healing me through that process. So, you know, sometimes we ask the Lord, you know, why me? Why am I going through this? Why am I going through another season um, of pain? But the reality of it is, is that God never misses an opportunity to use a dark or, or, or difficult season in our lives. He yeah. will always use it for his glory and for our good. Amen. And that's my life scripture, Romans 8 and 28. He makes all things work together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So there's always purpose in the pain. There's always purpose after the pain. And there's always purpose through the difficult seasons. Amen to that. Well, if you guys want to know more of Christina's amazing story, and it is truly amazing with so many different miracles, I highly encourage you guys to get Christina's book. It's called Hope in 60 Seconds, and it's available wherever books are sold. And also, make sure you guys follow her on social media, TikTok, Instagram, all that good stuff. Christina, thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you for sharing the hope of Jesus with so many people.
Thank you for having me, Ashley. It was great to be with you. Of course. God bless you. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. There are growing concerns over the rise of COVID infections. Health officials are sounding the alarm over the threat from a new subvariant. The White House COVID response team said Omicron subvariant BA5 is responsible for more than half of new infections. Right now, an average of 5,200 Americans are hospitalized every day with COVID-19, the highest number of daily admissions since February, with the U.S. averaging some 100,000 new cases a day. John Gray, pastor of Relentless Church, a megachurch in Greenville, South Carolina, is doing better after doctors admitted him to the critical care unit, suffering from a pulmonary embolism with additional blood clots in his lungs, which can lead to heart failure or death, although the overwhelming majority of people do survive. Gray's wife, Aventure, posted an update on Instagram late Monday, announcing his leg clot was gone and thanking people for their prayers and outpouring of love, saying, please continue. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Well, just a reminder, next Wednesday, July 20th, we'll be featuring your voicemails on this program. Pat and Wendy will be here to answer your questions. So to leave a question, all you have to do is call the number on your screen right now. It's 1-800-677-7884. Make sure you guys call today. The, the lines are open from now until 5 p.m. Eastern time. So once again, make sure you give us a call, 1-800-677-7884. And be sure to tune in to the 700 Club next Wednesday, July 20th. Gordon? Well, today, Joy Adler has more than enough money to pay her bills, and she then has extra leftover for savings. She and her husband recently upgraded to a bigger house. But years ago, Joy was facing financial ruin after her identity was stolen, her credit cards were maxed out. Well, then she followed some advice from her father-in-law and made an amazing comeback. I didn't know what happened until the bank called me and they told me that I owe $14,000. I was scared. I don't know what to do. Not long after Joy Adler came to the U.S. from the Philippines, she was the victim of financial fraud. Someone she knew stole her identity and maxed out her credit card. My husband told me to pay the debt and I was like, where are we going to get the money? He said, OK, we need to let it go and file bankruptcy. Joy and her husband, Don, were living in Hawaii at the time. It's really expensive, and I work two jobs, and it's still not enough. It's hard. The family moved to Tennessee to live with Don's parents. They also started going to church. Joy became a Christian and immediately found the 700 Club online. I was like, this is like my second church <laughs> in line. Meanwhile, her father-in-law gave her some financial advice. He told me, Joy, you guys need to tithe. You have to give to the Lord in order to bless you. The couple was still low on cash and sometimes had to use food stamps. So they gave what they could when they could. Joy's in-laws helped them get into an apartment. When the couple's car broke down, Joy knew something had to give. I said, OK, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And God told me, you have to surrender. Surrender everything to me. That time, I'm not giving regularly. I was like, OK, I decided to give faithfully. Things quickly changed after Joy and Don made giving first and giving consistently a priority. And when Joy prayed that Don would get a new job, he did. The couple moved to Michigan, where they got a small home. Soon, Don was making 70% more than he'd made before. When we moved here, he's making every two weeks like 5000 Even after a car accident that left Don without a paycheck for four months, they never stopped giving. They lived on Joy's part-time teacher's assistant salary and never went without. I still give him my tithes faithfully. That's why I'm not worried about what's going to happen because his words is true, his promises. I hold on to his promises. Along the way, she continued to be encouraged by the 700 Club. 
One story she saw prompted her to start giving to CBN. She's a single mom with two kids, and she don't have food for her kids, and touch my heart. It breaks my heart. So I called 700 Club to partner with them. And since then, it's awesome. Lord blesses us more than I expected. As the couple kept tithing and giving, they were able to rebuild their credit. They had enough money to pay their bills, get two more cars, save, and increase their pledge to CBN. They also upgraded to a bigger and better house. It's, it's God's goodness and grace. I believe that if you give more, you will be blessed more. That's why I'm, I'm encouraging a lot of people to give and trust the Lord. He will provide whatever happens. He will take care of you. He will take care of you. The promise from Scripture, from Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You can have that blessing, and you can have the blessing of heaven, the windows of heaven opened over your life. How? By doing what Scripture tells you to do, which is to give 10%, to say, yes, I'll tithe to the Lord. I'll do it His way. I'll live life His way. You saw what happened to Joy. It can happen to you because God is not a respecter of persons. What is He looking for? He's looking for faith. He's looking for belief and people who act on that faith and act on that belief to say, yes, I'll trust you with my finances, I'll trust you with my future, and I'll trust your word that surely goodness and mercy will follow me. If you want to start a life of giving, this isn't an on-again, off-again thing. This is a commitment to say, I am going to tithe. I'm going to do it on a regular basis. If you'd like to start doing that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. A lot of different club levels you can join at. We have 700 Club at $20 a month, 700 Club Gold at $40 a month, 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, call us now and realize your gift is going to help people around the world. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion is going into evangelism to preach the gospel through CBN International, again, around the world. We're doing things right here at home in the United States, but we want to be an international ministry. We need your help to do it. We have so many open doors for us. We want to be able to confidently walk through them to help people and to preach the gospel. You're a part of all of it when you join. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. Loretta Lynn has spent her career surrounded by fans and other celebrities. Her granddaughter, Taya Lynn, spent 14 years surrounded by darkness and death. Taya said she sold her very soul to pay for pills, and eventually the heavy drinking and hard drugs took their toll. At one point, she weighed just 80 pounds and felt completely lost. I can remember the first time I drank. I just loved the way that it made me feel. Taylor Lynn is the granddaughter of legendary country music artist Loretta Lynn. She spent the first years of her life near the glow of her grandmother's celebrity. But when her parents divorced and her mother remarried, Taylor's life suddenly changed. Their wedding night was the first time that he kicked me across the room, crawled down the hall into my bedroom. And it's one of those moments where you're just, you're, you grow up all of a sudden really fast and go, oh, okay. In her teens, Taylor turned to alcohol to take away the fear. She says it made her feel invincible, but inside she carried the burden of rejection. I deserved it. It was my fault. Um, I think when you are a fighter, you think that you're bad. So it's really me that's the problem. The alcohol she used to cover her pain sent her on a path of personal destruction. The alcohol stole my integrity fast. Things that I can't imagine a 15, 16 year old girl doing. It just took away whatever felt like was good in me was tainted. Her Aunt Bill told her stories from the Bible that gave her peace. Even through the abuse and her own bad choices, 
Taylor found comfort knowing Jesus loved her. She would say, you're not alone. Remember that you're not alone. Jesus is with you all the time. Like all you have to do is close your eyes and Jesus is there. And so I can remember so many times like being in my closet, just going, I'm not alone. Jesus is here. And without that, I don't know what that would have, I don't know what my life would have looked like had I not thought, let's, you know, either let's do it, let's fight, or like, I'm bad and nobody loves me and I want to just run away. But the whole time, Jesus was always like in my pocket and always, that never changed. By the time she was 18, Taylor found the party scene in downtown Nashville and used her family name to get anything she wanted. I learned very quickly how to go to bars in Nashville and use her name to get my drink spot. It was no time at all. So I was introduced to cocaine and cocaine dealers, and I quickly went down. Taylor went into rehab, then was hooked again almost as soon as she was out. She convinced herself she didn't have a problem as she fell farther into a dangerous and dark lifestyle. I sold my soul to pay for pills. I just was a gross person. I did gross stuff in order to survive being an addict. I certainly dated drug dealers or whoever I had to be with to get what I needed. I stole so much money from both of my grandmothers. Once I ran out of some money and tried, went to heavier drugs like crack and heroin, then I was gone. I mean, I was 80 pounds and lost. After 14 years of heavy drinking and two years of heroin and crack addiction, Taylor felt darkness and death were constant companions. There was a dark energy that was leading everything I was doing, and because I was disconnected, I was allowing that dark energy to do whatever it wanted to with me, and I was just, whoever Taylor really was, was just gone. One night, Taylor was arrested for a hit and run in Nashville. After a stop in jail, she ended up in rehab, where she was finally ready for change. That feeling of hope, it was coming back right then. It started right then. I just prayed. I said, God, I, I have to be done. And I have no idea how not to crave these drugs. I don't know how to stop, but I feel like this is my last chance. Please help me. If you. If you show up, you know, then I'm done. I said, I'm surrendering. And I was released from that bondage. Right then, God just took the chains and they were gone. Now, I still had some physical cravings for the drugs and alcohol, but God was right there. And it just felt like I let God just cover me. The love of God has continued to cover Taylor since her moment of surrender. Today, Taylor is married and has a family. She is grateful for the work God continues to do in her life. It's calling another alcoholic. It's being of service to someone. It's going to church. It's listening to worship music. It's doing the right thing. It's not running from God. It's when I do sin, which is about daily, letting him know, hey, I know you can see this already. Please help me figure out whatever it is you want me to do. Whatever I need to do to be a vessel for you, show me that. I know that that is my main purpose here, is to be your vessel, to be your child, and go out and spread your word. Show me how to do that today. I mean, God never left me. I put a curtain up and built up some black demons around me and said, not today, Lord. But he's always there, so the minute that I came back and said, I'm here, can I come home? Of course, of course, he's so happy that I'm home. Wow, what, is it, what an amazing story. You know, that's what God does for every single one of us who says, Jesus, I'm done doing life my way, and I want you. That is what Taylor did. And as you just heard her say, I mean, she built walls. And how many of us build those walls to keep God out of our lives? Because we have this misconception 
of who God is, that he's going to be angry at us for the things that we've done. He's going to be angry at us from running away from him. When the reality is that he's not angry with you. He loves you with an everlasting love, so much so that he's actually running towards you. He's running towards you. And the moment we just slightly turn our faces towards him, he's right there, ready to hold us, ready to lavish his love upon us, to rescue us, to save us because that is why Jesus died on the cross. That is why our heavenly father sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You can be the whosoever. It is anybody who just gives it all up, surrenders just like Taylor did to let Jesus in. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, no one is too far gone from the love of Jesus. We can't escape the love of God. We can ignore it. We can run away from it. But God is calling you home today. I believe that with every fiber of my being. He's calling you home. And here's the decision we have to make is, are we ready to say yes? And if you just watch that story and you're listening to me now and there's a burning inside of you, you've never said yes before or you said yes many years ago and you've run away, kind of like how Taylor did. She got into drugs and alcohol and she thought those things would fulfill her. But you've realized that it doesn't fulfill you at all. I'm here to tell you it's the love of Jesus that will fulfill you. It is our identity in Christ as a son and daughter of the Most High God. So pray with me right now. Say yes to Jesus. Surrender all today so that you can start living a life that is full, that is joyous, that is peaceful, where your addictions will not control you anymore because you have the blood of Jesus inside of you and you have Jesus on your side fighting for you. Just pray this simple prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I cry out to you right now. I'm done doing life my way and I turn from my wicked ways and I turn my face towards you, Heavenly Father. Forgive me of my sins, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and the sins of this world. Today, I make you Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Continue to set me free from the bondages. Thank you, Lord, I love you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. If you just pray that prayer with me, please do one more thing. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. We've got some amazing free resources that are gonna help you on this new faith journey and also prayer warriors who are ready, willing, and able to pray for anything you need for. Gordon. Well, thanks for being with us today. We leave you with these words from Colossians. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. It's amazing, that's the gospel. You can become like Jesus. You can think like him, you can act like him, you can be remade to his image. God bless.